men are doing more of those. Um, just to get a sense of whether or not there's agreement on what is promotable task, we did a survey of a number of faculty members, and we said, suppose you have an assistant professor and they have an additional 50 hours. How should they spend those hours? Should they work on a research paper, go to a conference? Should they work on an undergraduate curriculum review? Should they serve on faculty senate? Any suggestions as to how they responded? 92% of all faculty said you should be working on research if you want to get promoted. So those are the promotable tasks. The same thing happens if you look in industry. Everybody understands that bringing in revenue is what's going to make the firm want to keep you, and it's what's going to get you outside offers. Okay? So as I said before, when we look at academia or industry, there is broad agreement in all the studies that women are doing more of what we would categorize as less promotable work. Now we could sort of say, okay, is that a problem? Is it a problem? There's a, a disturbing interview or study on engineers where they're finding that women are dropping out because they don't feel like they're doing the work that they were trained to do, that they end up being note takers and organizing events instead of actually doing the engineering work that they got their training to do. So we could sort of say, why are we concerned about this? Well, one of the reasons why we're concerned about it, especially when it shows up early, is that from the corporate perspective, I hire a large number of men and women. They all have really good training. What I want to figure out really early on is, who are the good workers? Who are the ones who can bring in the most revenue? And if I don't let everyone, independent of who they are, take on the same share of work. I'm never going to be able to figure out who my good workers are. Okay, so even if the women come in and they're really talented, if I give them tasks that don't let them show how good they are bringing in revenue, they're not going to get to that point. And I can tell you, in talking to recent graduates, these problems show up very quickly. I spoke to a woman who was working in mergers and acquisition. She was very excited. She had been tasked with bringing in interns for the firm. That's, bringing in interns is a really good job, but she was hired in mergers and acquisitions. And similarly, I spoke to another woman who was assigned a client all by herself, and she felt like that was really, really good. What's the problem with being assigned a client all by yourself is that nobody is going to watch what you're doing. So it's really a question of figuring out where is it that they're going to see what you can do so that you get promoted for the talent that you actually have? Okay. So that, that's why we're concerned by these differential task assignments. We want them to be similar early on. Now, we could sort of talk about, well, why, why might we see these differences? It could be that women just don't want the same kinds of tasks that men have. It could be that they're not as willing to task. But if that's what it is, maybe we should start by finding out. So certainly, once we've figured out that there are differences, it's okay that we give them different assignments. But we need to give them the same opportunity to figure it out because the corporations want the best talent. It could be discrimination, but what I've been focused on is whether or not there are behavioral differences that cause these differences to arise everywhere. So in particular, what I'm going to talk to you about is an older study I did with my colleague at Stanford, very old Needley, where we look at whether or not gender differences in competition arise and what could sort of bring those about. And then I'm going to talk about a more recent study uh, with Linda Back, Cog Maria Ricalde, a former student of mine, and Lori Weingard, where we look at sort of the differences. So this is sort of saying how much are people leaning in to fight for these attractive, promotable tasks. This is saying who's getting stuck with the non-promotable work, and it's the reason why we see fewer women on the high promotability, is that because they're being held back by all of this non-promotable work they're doing. So uh, let's start with the competitive tasks. Um, so we see men competing all the time. We don't fully understand why they're competing. One of the examples would be men are playing football. That's a very competitive sport. But they also happen to be better at playing football. So just showing that men are playing football doesn't mean that they're more competitive. So uh, we took this into our laboratory. 
at the University of Pittsburgh, and what we wanted to figure out was just to say, do men like to go into competitions more, and why? So uh, the experiment that we set up was we brought a whole bunch of undergraduates into our laboratory, and we asked them, we told them, you have five minutes, and uh, over a series of different tasks, you're going to be asked to add up five two-digit numbers. You have two minutes, or you have five minutes to do as many as you possibly can. And the amount we're going to pay you depends on the particular task that you're in. And every time you submit an answer, it comes back and says right or wrong, and it tells you how many you've solved correctly so far. And then there's a big stopwatch that buzzes and says time is over. So it's a very tense task. Um, people are adding up numbers as quickly as they can. Uh, and here are the tasks that we give them. So they're paired in groups of two men and two women. They can see the other people in their group. We don't talk about gender at any point, but they can see who's in the group. And the first time they do it, we say, now you have five minutes. Every time you solve a problem correctly, you get 50 cents. So people solve the task, they go along. Uh, and then we move on. We say, now you're going to be in a competition with the three other people in your group. If you solve more problems, you get $2. Right? So now you want to beat the other people. You want to have the highest performance possible. And then for task three, we say, OK, now you get to do it one more time. But you get to decide what you want to do. If you want to go into the competition and compete against the other people who were in task two, so you just have to beat the three other people and their performance in task two. So you have a chance of getting $2 again per problem that you solve. Or do you just want the piece rate and get 50 cents? Now, of course, if you think you're going to win the competition, it's clear what you should do, right? You should go into the competition. So um, let's first look that we also ask them to say, how good do you think you are in your group, um, and so on and so forth. But let's, let's look at how they do. So they go in, they add up all these numbers. Uh, the reason why we picked this task is precisely because we're going to see next is that men and women are equally good at adding up five two-digit numbers. Whether or not there's the piece rate of the tournament, they solve the same number of problems. So given that they solve the same number of problems, what should we expect to see? We should expect to see the same number of men and women going into the competition. What do we actually see? We see that the men, 75% of them, say, I want to take the competition, and only a third of the women say, I want the competition. So even though they had the exact same experience up to this point, they separate. So why do you think this might be? Why do the women, despite the fact that they have the same performance as the men, choose not to compete? What would you do? Would you compete? Would you take the 50 cents for every task you solved, or would you go in and <coughs> compete for $2 for every problem? Who would compete? <laughs> okay. This looks very much like my experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Who would take the piece rate? Yeah. <laughs> so why? Are you choosing the competition versus, why would the women choose it less? Let's try to think about it. if you were running this experiment. You're trying to figure out what could it be? What could possibly cause these differences? Yes? Could be differences in, in individuals' utility functions. If a way of, if it might be plausible to think that uh, women and some men chose not to be in the competition, they factor in other people's utility in addition to their own. So that's a very good point, which is, so that's, that was a concern that we had very much in setting up this experiment, which is why we let them compete against the performance of others in task two, because we were very concerned about precisely that. We were concerned that some people would choose not to compete because them winning would impose what we call an externality on others. So we, we did not want that to play a role. What's another possible? I was just going to say, like, when we sell contracts and stuff, like, confidence factors into how people, like, choose to have an appetite for variable pay versus fixed pay. So, I mean, in a competition, it's unsure, so if you feel more sure of yourself, you have more confidence, but your performance relative to others, you're going to participate in that. 
Absolutely. So confidence could play a very big role. So that's part of the reason why we need to get a sense of how confident people are. So I may know that you have the same performance, but you may believe that you had a better performance than others, but you don't actually get that feedback. Yes? Were these groups uh, mixed men and women? Were they co-ed? Yes. So there are two men and two women in each group. Exactly. So that's that's exactly part of what we wanted. So, um, Part of the reason you could also say, why are you choosing math? Most people think that men are better at math, that's going to create a confidence gap. Part of the reason why we picked math was precisely because the environment where we see women not advancing is one that's dominated by men, where men are perceived to be the ones who are better. So just to give you a sense of, it could also be that men just enjoy competition. Right? That, could, that could be another driver. So uh, if we just look at people, so this is how people actually performed. This is the top quartile. So the top 25% who are going to win. Right? And as you can see, the women enter at much lower rates. In fact, the highest performing women enter less than the lowest performing men. Now, if you are a company, you, you are really concerned about these high performing women not coming into the competition. Okay. Now, as it was being proposed, one of the things that could be driving this is confidence. Right? So then we also said, tell us how good you think you are. And if you get it right, we're going to give you a dollar. Okay? So you have an incentive to get this right. So I say, um, do you think you're first, second, third, or fourth? Now remember, men and women did equally well. <clears throat> so if people are perfectly calibrated, we should see 25% at each level. So let's first look at the men. We asked them, do you think first, second, third, or fourth? What is your rank? 75% of the men think that they were first. Okay. That's overconfidence. Okay. By all measures, that's overconfidence. Um, now what you can also see, it's not that women are underconfident. Rather, they're not quite as overconfident as the men. So women also think that they're more likely to be in the top. They think they're either first or second. But remember, these numbers should be 25% everywhere. So both of them are overconfident. It's just that the men are far more overconfident than women. So confidence clearly plays a role. But now I can also say, suppose I took all the men and women who just told me, I think I'm best. And I said, do they all enter the competition at the same rate? Now, if there's no difference in taste for competition, that rate should be the same. And in fact, what we see is that among the people who told me, I think I'm best, we see that the men are entering far more than the women. So, among the men and women who thought that they were best, there's about a 30 percentage point gap in whether or not you go into the competition. So it seems like there are two things that are driving this. One is the confidence. Men are far more overconfident. And the second one is that there seems to be a difference in taste for competition. Okay. So that's sort of the, the competition uh, result where we're seeing these very large differences going into the competition. Uh, Muriel and I have a review piece. This is a paper that has been replicated all over the world. Uh, there's one study uh, that does not replicate, which is done with matrilineal women and men uh, in India, but outside of that. This is a very robust result. Um, and there are some differences. It depends on which task you use, but by and large, uh, this study shows up what is uh, quite amazing is that these differences in competition, your willingness to go into the competition is predictive of your future income. It's predictive of the jobs that you get subsequently. So there is something very fundamental in this competitive drive. Now the question is, what should we do about that? So here I am as the firm, I'm looking at these women not going into the competition. And indeed if we ask leading female um, executives what women should do, they sort of all have this, we should fix the women, right? We should, uh, they should just take on new challenges, even if you're not completely ready, you should just go for it. Women have a confidence gap. You should take risks, you shouldn't fear failure. 
at some point we also have to say, <coughs> what kind of leader is it that we want in these companies? Do we want leaders who are super competitive and overconfident? I would be nervous about investing in a firm that had a very competitive leader who was overconfident about his own ability. So it's not clear what we should do about this. Right? I think there is a lot more, I mean, there are certainly things that we can talk about, but there are hard issues to solve. Because we can't just send women to this training camp to make them overconfident and get them to compete more. Because it's not clear that's what we want. And it's not clear how we get the men to stop being like that. Okay. So uh, I think there's a lot more to be said for looking at the opposite end of the spectrum. And the fix is there, a very, very low hanging fruit. So let's think about how, when we come into a job, we allocate the less promotable task. We're certainly not competing for it because this is the kind of work nobody wants. Okay. So uh, we typically get to that by asking for volunteers. So this, as I said before, is joined with Babcock, Ripeld, and Weingard. Um, and part of what I started thinking about in, in setting up these studies was to say, when I go into a meeting, we often have um, promotion and tenure meetings at the University of Pittsburgh, where we come in, and at the very beginning of the meeting, the dean says, uh, who wants to be the chair of the committee? You see, being chair of the committee sounds like it's really attractive. It's not. It just means that you go away and you get to write a report for the next couple of days. Okay? That's why these chairs have little rollers so you quickly can push back and say that you're... But what happens at every meeting is that everybody quickly rolls back and announces the surprising fact that they're really busy. And then somehow we sit around and we all know <coughs> that if we don't find a volunteer, the dean is going to be really, really unhappy. So the worst outcome is not finding a volunteer. The best outcome is you can get somebody else to volunteer and you can walk out and be happy. So that's what we wanted to study. We wanted to study who is it who raises their hand and says, sure, I will, I will take one for the team and be the volunteer. We also wanted to figure out if the dean could ask in advance who are they going to ask and then see who volunteers when they've been asked. Okay? So we wanted to set up a situation similar to this that we can study in our laboratory. Uh, but before getting to the laboratory, we got some data uh, from a big uh, university um, where they had sent out precisely the kind of email that we're looking for. Remember, the faculty that we asked early on, they had said that being on faculty senate was not a promotable task. So they had sent out all these emails to faculty saying, can you please be on faculty senate? Faculty senate is the place where you handle all uh, major businesses within the university. It's the overseeing unit that makes sure that the business that is done within the university is done correctly. But it's pretty much on a volunteer basis. Okay, so we sent out, this request was sent out, and if you're wondering why not they were jumping at the bid, 3.7% of faculty said, sure, I'll do that. Okay. This is not something people are eager to do. What is disturbing is that only 2.6% of the men said yes. You think, well, how bad is that? Well, there are many, many, many fewer women than there are men. So that corresponds to 7% of the women. That's three times more of the women who said yes to this. Now, then we could say, well, does it actually work out to women serving more than men? Well, <coughs> if we look at the share of women, so remember, assistant professors, they're the ones who want to get tenure. They've just gotten their PhD. They want to stay and have their job. They need to get as much research done as possible. Most institutions make sure they don't have to do any service work because we want them to get tenure. So we have 38% of all faculty at the assistant professor level being women. Let's look at how many actually end up serving on faculty senate. 60% of the assistant professors who are faculty senate are women. If they're doing a lot more service work, they can't get promoted at the same rate. If they don't have, I mean, magically, and unfortunately, women don't have more hours in the day. If, so if they're doing more service work, they don't have the same time to get their research done. Now, of course, this could just be because women like to be a faculty center. Okay, I can't rule that out. So we took this to our laboratory. 
as I said before, uh, we want to mirror this decision that I talked about. So here's the way we did it. Bring a bunch of people into our lab. We tell them, you're going to be paired with three people. You, you have <coughs> 10 times of doing this. You're randomly paired with somebody new in every round. And in every group of three people, you don't know exactly who it is. You know it's just somebody in your, from the room. You have two minutes to decide why not to click a button. Okay? And uh, the round ends when somebody clicks. If nobody clicks the button, everybody gets a dollar. But if you are the one who clicks, you get a dollar twenty-five, and the two other people get two dollars. So someone should just click. Everyone is going to be happier if someone just clicks. Just like with the dean asking for somebody to chair the committee. So here's what happens. If nobody raises their hand, everybody gets a dollar. If you raise your hand, you get a dollar twenty-five, the two other people get two dollars. But if you could just get someone else to raise the hand, you would get the two dollars. So you just want somebody else to raise the hand. Except if nobody is, then you would rather raise your hand. Okay? So let's see what happens. Um, this is the exciting screen. This is your volunteer button. Counter is counting down. When two minutes are up, you all lost out. Everybody gets a dollar. So let's see what happens. It turns out they know to click the button. 80% of the time somebody clicks the button. These are University of Pittsburgh students. I'm sure it would be better here. But they know it's a good thing to click the button. But let's look at the gender difference. <coughs> Women volunteer about a third of the time. And they stay stable over all the 10 rounds that they're in. What about the men? They are below the rate of women the whole way through. It's not as if they don't click the button and they get to the end and they wonder what would happen if I click the button. They hold out on clicking the button. In fact, if you look at the distribution, you can see, so this is the number of times out of 10 that you're clicking. You can see that there are women who are clicking 10 out of 10 times, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. And they're doing it way more than men, whereas there are about 50% of men who never click or click once. So if you sort of think, and with three people, we want to get this done, I should be doing it three times. If I just did it three times a little bit more, we're going to be, it's going to be good. This is the share of women who are clicking three or more times. This is the share of men who are doing less than the three times. Okay. So they're very large differences. So we could say, well, why is that? Why, why are we seeing women jumping up like this? Well, it could be a question of preferences. It could be the women are just more nervous about not getting the clicking in. Uh, it's been suggested that maybe men are just really good at clicking buttons. It turns out that it's not the clicking part that's driving it. Um, it could be that women are more altruistic. It could be that women are looking out at the group and saying, I care more about this group, that's why I keep clicking, which is perfectly fine. Um, or it could be that it's coming from beliefs. I come into this room, I'm playing this game that I've never played before, and I'm trying to think, how do we usually play these games? And if I look around and I see that all the men are there, and I'm female, and I realize the way we play this game is that they're not going to click. Well, if they're not going to click, then I have an incentive to click. If I can't count on other people clicking, it's in my interest to click. And the men may look around and say, how do we play these games? Oh, I remember the way we usually play this kind of game is that the women will click. So if that's the way we play it, then women should be clicking more because they can't count on the men. Now the question is, how, how do we distinguish between these two? So basically, this is what we call a coordination game in economics. We're trying to figure out how to play this. I'm sure you've seen the battle of the sexist game. We're trying to figure out how do we get to the best outcome without really knowing what the other party is doing. Okay? So um, there are two ways we could do this. We could elicit all their preferences and say, how altruistic are you? Uh, we did that. We see some differences. It does make a big difference. But then we came up <coughs> with what we think is a clever way of looking at the role of belief and distinguishing between beliefs and preferences. Because what I could say is, if it's coming from women being more altruistic, then I should be able to run a session 
with only women. The women come in, they're all altruistic. I should see them contributing far more than the men if the men are all by themselves. Because the, if the men are just not altruistic, they just shouldn't volunteer so much. So can you see how that's distinguishing between the two? Because now if it's coming from beliefs, I should see women decrease the rate at which they're investing because the men are no longer there. They don't have to invest anymore. So that's precisely what we did. So whereas before where we had the mixed gender sessions, where it was either two women or one woman uh, in the group, we now run sessions where you show up for the experiment and it just so happens that only men are there. Or we run a study where it just so happens that it's only women who show up. Okay. And what we want to see is what happens to the investment rate. So remember, if it's coming from women being really altruistic, they should be investing more than in the mixed gender session. What do we see from the female session? Exact same. So what that means is that the women look around, they see that there are other women, they realize it's not just on them anymore. What about the men? When they come in and they see the women are not there, if it's because men are not altruistic, we should see them invest less. But they invest at the exact same rate. It's just they don't do it when the women are around. Okay. So it's not that they don't know how to click the button, it's just that they don't do it when the women are in the room. Okay. So in the single sex sessions, we see the exact same rates of investments um, by men and women. So what we think this suggests is that it's coming from beliefs, the belief that women will do it more than men. There's another way of looking at that. It is to say, suppose we had a boss that before they're trying to figure out who is going to invest, before we do the exact same environment, the boss gets to send a note and just say, hey, can you invest? And then the people get to see who was being asked for, and then they do the exact same thing. Okay. So the way we do this, we now have four people in the group. The boss can't invest by him or herself. It's just that boss gets $2 if someone invests, $1 if nobody invests. Does that make sense? Yes? But two people think it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so this is the screen that they see. These are graduate students. These were not allowed to show the undergraduates um, that were in the study. But the manager gets to see the three people in his or her group and gets to send a message saying the red player asked you to invest. The person who's the manager is called the red player. And the two other people who are in the group are told this person was asked to invest. So uh, let's see who was asked. So obviously since we're three people, sometimes you get one female and two males. So let's look at all the groups where we had one female and two males. And what we see, if if there is this belief that women invest more, we should see them being asked more. And indeed, we see women are being asked more than men. Now, you would say, well, of course, like, I don't know who to ask here, and the woman is different than the two men, that's why I'm asking her more. But then we should be able to put another female in this group, and we should see the men being asked 40% of the time. And the rate that we're asking the women should go down, and what we're seeing instead, when we put one woman in, remember before the man was asked 30% of the time, we would expect that rate to go up if it's just because he's different. So if I put a female in the group, what we see instead is the rate by which the man is being asked goes down. Why does it go down? Because women are still asked 40% of the time. So it's perfectly consistent with this belief that women are expected to do it more. And then you could also ask, uh, so this, of course, as you can imagine, who we ask for favors, I was getting a lot coming over here. We look around to see who's most likely to ask us. So as you can imagine, depending on whether or not you're smiling, look friendly, whatever, there's heterogeneity in who you end up asking for a favor. Can you please invest for us? But what you can see is that the women are just asked a lot more than the men. So even though there is heterogeneity, the requests go more to the women. Yes? Um, did you look at to see if how those rates are different across whether the person who does the designating is male or female? That's a very good question. 
because that comes exactly back to whether or not this is a belief we're holding. Right? Because if it's a belief that we're holding that women are just slightly more likely, we should be seeing that being the same rate for men and women. Yeah. And indeed, that is what it is. It does not matter if you have a male or female manager if they both ask the women more. Okay? Then you can say, can it possibly be a good idea to keep asking these women? They're asked over and over and over again. Why do we keep asking them? Are they actually going to say yes? And it turns out, despite the fact that women are being asked a lot more, it is a good idea to ask them because when you ask the female to do it, she will say yes 75% of the time. And even though men are asked less, they say yes 50% of the time. So it's not surprising that we end up with this reinforcing equilibrium where women are asked more, say yes more, and volunteer more. So um, we think what um, sort of by and large what's coming out of this is that we're seeing that women are volunteering more, they're being asked more, and when they're asked they say yes. And pretty much everything we've done suggests that this is coming from the leads. And in fact, we can ask third parties, what do you think is going to happen here? And they will say we think the women are going to invest more. Okay. Now what's comforting about beliefs is that it's something that's not so hard to do something about. We can start talking about this issue and the beliefs could change. So part of what we've found uh, in talking to com companies is that this is something they just weren't thinking about. It's not necessarily that we want to be mean to women. It's just if we're not paying attention to something, bad things can happen. If I'm a manager who's really busy, and I'm trying to get something done that I know three of the guys will object to and somebody else will say yes to, where am I going to give that task? I'm going to give it to the person who says, sure, I'll handle that. But you can also see from the corporation's perspective, this is not a question of fixing the women. We need to get these tasks done. It's just a question of fixing the way that we distribute them. If we can't have organizations where everybody says no, if you say no in an organization, you lose your job. Right? So it's not a question of just encouraging people to say no, that's not good enough for me. What we need to encourage is that we think about how we allocate these tasks. And the benefit of this is that this is non-promotable work. It is work where it doesn't matter so much who's doing it. So rather than asking for volunteers, we just randomly assign it. We could take terms. Right? Um, it's clear that just bringing awareness to how we allocate the non-promotable work can change the way that we allocate it. So um, if we talk about how easy it is to give it to the women, if we start holding people accountable and just saying, can we just talk about who's doing what? will make it harder to just give it to the person who smiles and says good morning and yes, please, I'll do it. Okay. Um, of course, um, in the meantime, as we're talking about fixing some of these things, it also just helps to have senior mentors. So when you go out and you get your first job, finding somebody who's looking out for you so that before you go in to a meeting, you know well or not this is a client you should be taking on. Is this a task that would be good for you? Uh, we've spoken to managers who have coached women to, when they come into that uncomfortable situation where everybody's sitting around the the room and nobody wants to take the client, and tell them, just look at what everybody else is doing. Start folding off your sleeves and checking your phone and rolling back from the table. Find comfort in just holding out for a little bit so that you don't just jump in. Okay. So um, I think a lot of this is really just that we need to be talking about it. And part of what, part of the reason why we should talk about it is not just that women are doing more of this. The intriguing thing that we're seeing in the all-male group is that, remember the 50% of men who never clicked or only clicked once? They don't move at all. The only reason why the male group gets to a higher level of investment is that the men who were volunteering suddenly have to volunteer a lot. So if you find yourself in an all-male group, you could very well end up being the super volunteer. So, it's a question for all of us in saying, 
we're better off if we identify the talent that's actually there. And the only way we can do that is if we give everybody the same chance at the promotable work. So just to give you a sense of how easy it is to fix this, so you can see how these are easy changes. Okay. It's not something that's costly for the organization. If you hire, you know, if you hire people out of business school, you typically hire about 50% male, 50% female. Making sure that for the first couple of years they get equal opportunity to show their talent is a really good thing for the corporation and for the individuals who are working there. Um, at Pitt, I've been fighting for a long time to change this lovely chair of committee assignment. Um, and as I said before, this does not take a lot to improve. So, um, sorry, I did not, this was supposed to show up later. This is our new uh, innovation. It has a hat with names in it, see? <laughs> Five years in the running, but we are here. Innovations happen all the time. Um, Part of uh, um, what I mean about awareness is just that we start thinking about the way that we see the world. Uh, there was um, um, this uh, beautiful picture uh, when we were talking about putting in the border wall. Um, Kirsten Nelson is the person who was running the, the meeting. She's the main person in charge. Um, of course, there are a lot of important people there as well, but she is the main person. This is a picture that was in the New York Times. We should start paying attention to what a woman in her position is doing when she leaves the meeting. Because what is she carrying? She should not be carrying the coffee out of the meeting. And it's just, just paying attention to the little things that's really going to give us um, a possibility for moving forward. Okay. Um, one of the things um, that this all came out of is that um, we have, I personally, for the past 10 years, we have our 10th year anniversary on Monday, um, have been in a no club. Uh, so until your institutions change, once you start getting jobs, uh, getting support from other people who are super volunteers <coughs> like yourself, um, can be a good way to start, but we're um, in the process of writing a book about that, um, which will be coming out in 2020. So um, that's all I have. So, thank you. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, or I, I think you guys have to leave at like 11 50, is that right? Let's take a few minutes for questions. Are there any? Well, now, in the past few years, there's more women getting college degrees and than men. Do you think that was going to have a big change in the workforce in the next decade? Like, will that perhaps change the percentage of women in leadership? Or? So th that's the reason why we're, so that's a very good question. Um, the reason why we're so concerned about it is that we have not seen a lot of change and women have been enrolled in colleges at higher rates than men for quite a while. So uh, we are seeing, so the women's greater enrollment in college uh, is definitely moving a lot of things. Uh, we've seen gender gap narrowing, uh, we've seen labor force participation changing. The, the problem is really an advancement. So we're seeing less of what we call horizontal dis discrimination or a few differences among people who hold the same position. But we're really seeing um, where we're seeing very large differences in sort of the vertical segregation between men and women uh, that just continues to be very large. And there are many reasons why it could be large. Like, so this is not to diminish. Women have children, and they tend to care more for those children uh, or stay home with those children more than men. That, that's perfectly fine. That's, we have different preferences. Maybe we have the same preferences. But it is true that women tend to spend more time at home with their children. And that will set your career back. Part of the concern is if we're seeing differences early on in terms of the opportunities that are offered to you, it may be harder for you to get back into the workforce after you've had those children. Okay, so it's really, it's not to say that men and women should be treated the same always. 
but they should have the same opportunities. So we shouldn't expect to see the same outcomes everywhere. But what we should expect is to see men and women, same experiences, same aspirations, same grades, everything, to have the same opportunities when they start up so that we don't end up seeing them going on different paths because they were never given the same opportunities. Okay? And it really, it's in everyone's interest that we get the same chance to show. I mean, I have a daughter right now. I, I can tell you what makes me very concerned about what is happening. I spoke to, um, I have a daughter who's going into college, just like you, taking lots of STEM classes, top of her class, super competitive, does all the sports, she does lots of charity work. She is really, I mean, she is my daughter, but I also think she's an amazing human being. I was talking to a recent graduate from Chicago who's working in finance in New York, and he was saying, well, you know the women are just there because of affirmative action. They don't have what it takes to succeed in New York. We're just waiting for them to fail. They're just there because we want to look good in the beginning, but then they're going to fail. This is someone who's one year out. And I look at my child and it's like, I've told you all along, if you just worked hard, if you just followed your dream, things would work out for you. And then when I hear comments like that, like how can they work out if you go into a world where everybody gives you the junk work because you're perceived not to have any talent. And when I inquired with this young man, is it because the females you're talking about didn't take the same classes? The answer was no. Did they get lower grades? No. What is it that they don't have? I don't know. They just don't have it. We can't, we can't do this to anyone. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's really, it's not to say everybody should be, end up with the same outcomes, but they should have the same opportunities given what they have done leading up to it. So, um, yes. So, this is awesome, by the way. I think that's great. Some of the suggestions are really, really cool. I was framed up. But, like, with regard to kind of what we just talked about, do you have any realizations about the source of this? Like, the actual source of the behavioral belief in terms of, like, is it a product of, we talked about, like, a woman entering the job market at the very beginning. Is it a product of expected future, like, I don't know, choices that may differ from what a man's spirit chooses? Or is this, like, a home, child, like, behavior roles thing? Because obviously it's not changing with women. Like you said, there aren't huge changes, even though we are getting a lot of education and quality and things like that, which we can better on, but we're, we're working on it. Um, do you have any theorizations about that or approaches? I, I think a lot of these differences are a result both of nature and nurture. Um, what is shocking is, you know, that's precisely where I brought up Denmark in the beginning. I felt that we were raised very differently from the males and females I see in the U.S. But we end up going to the exact same place. So I think we just, um, there, there's a lot of nurture in there. Um, it's hard to imagine that nature doesn't, we're trying to play these complicated coordination games. And we know that when we play coordination games, we coordinate on different things. And maybe we've just for a very long time coordinated on women, taking the low end of these tasks in many different who, you know, it's like my husband does dishes all the time. You know, he does a lot of the cooking. But it is true that there are many events that I go to where the women are the ones who get up after Thanksgiving and, and clear up the dishes. And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but that is the way that we coordinate on playing a lot of these games. There are certain things that we have come accustomed to women taking on and if we transfer that into the workplace we're just not going to be able to pull in the resources that we need from these women because they because they're going to college they have lots of skills and we should be tapping into the talent that they're bringing in okay, but where exactly it's coming from I don't know um, there are many things we do why don't we shake with the right hand instead of the left hand and say hello there are many things that we don't I understand how they came about, but if it's coming from beliefs, it doesn't take a lot to perturb them a little bit and say, wait a minute, did she just do that again? Did she just once again say, sure, I will organize that, or sure, I'll take it. Is that the way we should be doing that? Okay. So it's just to take a step back and think about how we do it, I think we can go. Good. Good.
I'm going to take a question here. 